Purgatory Explained, Part 2, Chapter 57 Advantages, Stimulant to Fervor, Cautions to Us If wholly religious pass through purgatory, although not detained there, have we not to fear that we shall not only pass through it, but also remain for a longer or shorter time? Can we live in a security that would be, to say the least, very imprudent? Our faith and our conscience tell us that our fear of purgatory is well grounded. I go still further, dear reader, and say that with a little reflection, you yourself must acknowledge that it is very probable and almost certain that you will go to purgatory. Is it not true that on leaving this earth your soul will enter into one of those three abodes pointed out to us by faith, hell, heaven, or purgatory? Will you go to hell? Is it not probable? Be it is not probable because you have a horror of mortal sin, and for nothing in the world would you commit one or keep it upon your conscience after having committed it. Will you go to heaven? Your answer immediately that you think yourself unworthy of such a favor. There remains then but purgatory, and you must own that it is very probable, almost certain, that you will go into that place of expiation. By setting this grave truth before your eyes, do not think, dear reader, that we wish to frighten you or take from you all hope of entering heaven without purgatory. On the contrary, this hope must ever remain deeply impressed upon our hearts, for it is the Spirit of Jesus Christ who no wise desires that his disciples should stand in need of future expiation. He even instituted sacraments and established all sorts of means to assist us to make full satisfaction in this world. But these means are too often neglected, and it is especially by a salutary fear that we are stimulated to make use of them. Now, what are those means which we have to employ in order to avoid or at least shorten our purgatory and mitigate its rigor? They are evidently those exercises and good works which most assist us to satisfy for our faults in this world and to find mercy before God, namely the following. Devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary and fidelity in wearing her scapular, charity toward the living and the dead, mortification and obedience, a pious reception of the sacrament, especially on the approach of death, confidence in the divine mercy, and finally, the holy ac acceptation of death in union with the death of Jesus upon the cross. These means are sufficiently powerful to preserve us from purgatory, but we must make use of them. Now, to employ them seriously and with perseverance, one condition is necessary. It is to form a firm resolution of satisfying in this world rather than in the next. This resolution must be based upon faith which teaches us how easy it is satisfaction in this life, how terrible is purgatory. Be at agreement with thy adversary betimes, says Jesus Christ, whilst thou art in the way with him, lest perhaps thy ad adversary deliver thee to the judge and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Amen, I say to thee, 
Thou shalt not go out from thence till thou repay the last farthing. Matthew 5.25 To be reconciled with our adversary in the ways in the way signifies in the mouth of our Lord to appease divine justice and to make satisfaction on our way through life before reaching that unchangeable end, that eternity where all penance is impossible and where we shall have to submit to all the rigors of justice. Is not this counsel of our divine Savior most wise? Can we appear before the tribunal of God burdened with an enormous debt which we might so easily have discharged by some works of penance and which we shall then have to pay by years of torment? He who purifies himself from his faults in the present life, says St. Catherine of Genoa, satisfies with a penny a debt of a thousand ducats. And he who waits until the other life to discharge his debts consents to pay a thousand ducats for that which he might have paid before with a penny. We must therefore begin with the firm and efficacious resolution of making satisfaction in this world that is the foundation stone. This foundation once laid, we must employ the means of enumerated above. Purgatory Explained, Part 2, Chapter 58 Means to Avoid Purgatory Great Devotion to the Blessed Virgin A servant of God sums up these means and reduces them to two, saying, Let us cleanse our souls by water and by fire, that is to say, by the water of tears and by the fire of charity and good works. In fact, we may classify them all under these two exercises, and this is conformable to Holy Scripture where we see that souls are cleansed from their stains and purified like gold in the crucible. But since we must seek above everything to be practical, let us follow the method we have indicated and which has been practiced with so much success by the saints and by all fervent Christians. In the first place, in order to obtain great purity of soul and in consequence to have little reason to fear purgatory, we must cherish a great devotion toward the Blessed Virgin Mary. This good mother will so assist her dear children in cleansing their souls and in shortening their purgatory that they may live in the greatest confidence. She even desires that they should not trouble themselves on this subject and that they should not allow themselves to be discouraged by excessive fear, as she herself deigned to declare to her servant, Jerome Carvalho, of whom we have already spoken. Have confidence, my son, she said to him. I am the mother of mercy for my dear children in purgatory as well as for those still living upon earth. In the revelations of St. Bridget, we read something similar. I am, said the Blessed Virgin to her, the mother of all those who are in the place of their expiation. My prayers mitigate the chastisements inflicted upon them for their faults. Book 4, Chapter 1 for those who wear the holy scapular have a special right to the protection of Mary. The devotion of the holy scapular, unlike that of the rosary, does not consist in prayer, but in the pious practice of wearing a sort of habit, which is as the livery of the Queen of Heaven. 
the scapular of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, of which we here speak, traces its origin back to the 13th century and was first preached by Blessed Simon Stock, fifth general of the Order of Mount Carmel. <clears throat> This celebrated servant of Mary, born in Kent, England, in the year 1165, while yet young, retired into a solitary forest to apply himself to prayer and penance. He chose as his dwelling the hollow of a tree, to which he attached a crucifix and a picture of the Blessed Virgin, whom he honored as his mother and ceased not to invoke with the tenderest affection. For twelve years he entreated her to make known to him what he could do that would be most agreeable to her divine son, when the Queen of Heaven told him to enter the order of Mart Carmel, which was particularly devoted to her service. Simon obeyed, and under the protection of Mary, became an exemplary religious and the ornament of the Order of Mount Carmel, of which he was elected Superior General in 1245. One day, it was the 16th of July, 1251, the Blessed Virgin appeared to him surrounded by a multitude of heavenly spirits and with a countenance radiant with joy she presented to him a scapular of a brown color, saying, Receive, my dear son, this scapular of thy order. It is the badge of my confraternity and the pledge of a privilege which I have obtained for thee and for thy brethren of Mount Carmel. Those who die devoutly clothed in this habit shall be preserved from the eternal fire. It is the sign of salvation, a safeguard in peril, a pledge of peace and special protection until the end of time. The happy old man everywhere published the favor he had received, showing the scapular, healing the sick, and working other miracles in proof of this mar marvelous mission. Immediately, Edward I, King of England, Louis IX, King of France, and after their example, almost all the sovereigns of Europe, as also a great number of their subjects, received the same habit. From that time commences the celebrated confraternity of the scapular, which was soon afterwards canonically erected by the Holy See. Not content with granting this first privilege, Mary made another promise in favor of the members of the confraternity of the scapular by assuring them of a speedy deliverance from the sufferings of purgatory. About fifty years after the death of Blessed Simon, the illustrious pontiff John the Twenty-Second, whilst at prayer in the early morning, saw the Mother of God appear surrounded with light and bearing the habit of Mount Carmel. Among other things, she said to him, If among the religious or members of the confraternity of Mount Carmel, there are any who, on account of their faults, are condemned to purgatory, I will descend into the midst of them like a tender mother on the Saturday after their death. I will deliver them and conduct them to the holy mount of eternal life. These are the words which the pontiff places on the lips of Mary in his celebrated bull of 3rd March 1322, commonly called the Sabbatine Bow. He concludes in these words, I therefore accept this holy indulgence. I ratify and confirm it upon the earth. 
as Jesus Christ has graciously granted it in heaven through the merits of the Most Blessed Virgin Mary. This privilege was afterwards confirmed by a great many bulls and decrees of the sovereign pontiffs. Such is the devotion of the Holy Scapular. It is sanctioned by the practice of pious souls throughout the Christian world, by the testimony of 22 popes, by the writings of an incalculable number of pious authors, and by multiplied miracles during the past 600 years. So that, says the illustrious Benedict the 14th, he who dares call in question the validity of the devotion of the scapular or deny its privileges would be a, a proud despiser of religion.